Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, uh, I apologize, I'll speak in English because I've learned that there are quite a few uh, English speaking uh, people in the, uh, in the audience, so I'll use my Chinglish, that's the Czech English. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank for the invitation uh, to this seminar where I would like to tell you something about the experiments which we perform with aerosol particles in molecular beams. Since the molecular beam techniques are a bit unique and most of the techniques which I'll talk about are not that generally used in chemistry, uh, I will allow myself a somewhat longer introduction telling you what we are actually studying and giving you a somewhat broader motivation. Uh, and then I'll also spend quite some time on describing our experiments. And uh, I'll give you three examples of the experimental studies which we are doing with our uh, um, experimental setups. And uh, no, I don't want to change anything. I'm fine with the color scheme I have. Thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, I'll talk about photochemistry of uh, molecules, namely hydrogen halides on ice nanoparticles. Uh, I'll talk about uh, uptake of molecules on ice particles and I'll talk about uh, mixed nitric acid ices. And uh, if time allows, which I think it won't, but if, then I might tell you about the other branch of our research which concerns uh, some uh, photophysics, photochemical processes in uh, biological relevant systems. Uh, so we do our experiments with clusters. Clusters are conglomerates of molecules which bind together by uh, forces typically uh, much, uh, much weaker than typical chemical bonds, uh, uh, covalent bonds, something like Van der Waals interactions or hydrogen bonds. Uh, these uh, clusters can be just dimers, but can, it can be conglomerates of tens, thousands of molecules. Now, we can produce these by supersonic expansion of the gas molecules into the high or ultra-high vacuum. And in this expansion process, the molecules tend to bind and generate these clusters. And we then interrogate them by various means experiments which I'll talk about. Now, just to the vocabulary, uh, I'll mostly talk about clusters, but if you have tens or hundreds of molecules, the physical dimension of your cluster is actually nanometers. So you can talk about free nanoparticles, and indeed, these nanoparticles, which are in the atmosphere, which you here in this institute address, you call them aerosols. So I'm talking about aerosols as well. So the general motivation uh, to uh, our experiments is essentially fundamental. What we really want to understand, what we really want to learn is certain chemical processes or physical processes at the molecular level. And in doing so, we want to proceed from single individual molecules building up clusters from several molecules all the way to the bulk systems. And we want to understand how the process evolves or how certain property evolves as a function of the size of the system. So that's the general motivation. It's purely fundamental. But indeed, we want to focus on something which has some practical relevance. And therefore, we focus on atmospheric relevant systems and the other part of our research focuses on uh, biologically relevant systems. Now, uh, molecular beams uh, have been developed, developed in the 70s with the general idea, uh, actually it has been developed by physicists, atomic physicists, but in the 70s the chemist realized that it's actually a great tool to understand chemistry at a molecular level, because if you do chemistry, indeed you do it in bulk, in solution. But what's really happening is when the two molecules meet and somehow the bonds change. But how do we want to investigate? If we do that in the bulk, we have a lot of secondary processes. So the idea behind molecular beams was we have 
beams of molecules, we collide the molecules, and we observe the chemical process, how it happens between, just between the two molecules, without any secondary reactions. Now, this is a great simplification of chemistry, but for real chemists, like you are probably, it's oversimplification. Because the basic chemical process, like acidic dissociation, Everybody knows if you put hydrogen halide, HCl, into the water, you get H3O plus and Cl minus. So I, as a physicist who has molecular beams, I take HCl molecule and collide it with water, and then I run to chemist and say, look, there is absolutely no reaction between HCO and water. And every chemist will laugh at me because, indeed, you all know there is a reaction, there is acidic dissociation. But the point is that that acidic dissociation happens via a collective action of several hydrogen bonds onto the HCl molecule because you need quite some force to tear it apart to generate this proton and Cl minus. So if you want to understand process like this at a molecular level, you have to study it with objects like this. So it's objects generated of a few molecules and those are essentially the clusters. So that's why we do chemistry in clusters. And uh, the practical motivation, let's say, what we focus on is the atmospheric chemistry, namely the ozone depletion process. Indeed, you all know that ozone depletion, uh, I'm Ozone chemistry is quite complicated. There are hundreds of reactions. I'm not talking about them. But the, the point behind the ozone depletion is that part of that chemistry is not only gas phase chemistry, but in, it involves reactions which proceed on the ice particles in the polar stratospheric clouds. And this is exactly what we focus on, because you have the ice particle, you have molecules like HCl, and you have the photons from the sun. And this is exactly what you can do in our laboratory. We can generate ice nanoparticle, put HCl molecule on it, and shine UV laser on it and observe what happens, what, how the reaction proceeds. And uh, that can tell us, give us some information about how these reactions proceed in the stratosphere, and, but we can understand them at a molecular level. So we will look at this in a second, but before we get to that, let me describe our experiment. So I have told you what we do, we do clusters, why we do that, the motivation, and now how. How do we do our experiments? Well, this is our club, cluster beam apparatus. Uh, it's not a commercial uh, apparatus, it's a... Uh, um, um, it's quite a unique and versatile, uh, versatile molecular beam machine which has been built in uh, Gettingen in the Max Planck Institute and in 2005 uh, I actually brought it as a kind of souvenir when I was coming back from Germany to Prague and uh, it's since then, since then uh, working in our uh, group and we have actually extended it um, just recently, in 2011, 2012, we have added quite a few other options to this apparatus, and it's now very unique, uh, essentially worldwide unique, and very uh, versatile apparatus where you, can per where you can perform a lot of different experiments, and some of them I'll talk about, but before doing that, I'll describe the machine in general. What options do we have? Just very briefly. We have the molecular beams, so we produce the clusters, as I have said, by supersonic expansion from the gas phase. Actually, in our apparatus, we have two beams. We can collide them, look at the reactions, but that's not what I'm going to talk about the expert today. The experiments which I'll talk about today, they are performed in the primary beam, in the cluster beam, which we direct into the apparatus. We can then absorb molecules on the clusters. I'll talk about that experiment. Uh, we can analyze the cluster beam by various means. For example, we can measure velocity uh, by putting a chopper into the beam and detecting the clusters at the end of the apparatus. 
by electron ionizing them and looking at ionized frag uh, fragments. We have one another mass spectrometer, which has quite a few unique features, which I'll mention later on. It's reflectron time of light mass spectrometer. And the heart of the machine is this imaging system, which I'll talk about, where we do the photochemistry, photodissociation experiments. Actually, for this imaging, to develop this imaging system, uh, we have built one another apparatus, apparatus for imaging, AIM, and uh, it's now serving as a, as a separate apparatus where we can also study photodissociation processes, especially with smaller species, with individual molecules. So here we can, here we can do uh, molecules, and here we do larger clusters. Now, these two uh, vacuum rigs are accompanied in our laboratory by quite a few lasers. We have three UV, uh, UV laser systems, two of them tunable, one fixed frequency, and we have one another infrared OPO, OPA system. We can direct the beams, uh, the laser beams, into the different viewports of our apparatus and perform different experiments, and some of them I'll now describe in detail. So the first one concerns photodissociation of molecules in clusters or nanoparticles or aerosol particles, if you will. So what you do is you use this part of our machine where you produce the clusters, dope them with some molecules, and then with lasers you photolyze the molecules and you look at some fragment. If you want to see some fragment, you have to ionize it. Always in almost any experiment, you are just looking at ion, uh, ion species. You have to measure electric signals, so you have to ionize them. So we do specifically ionize certain fragments by, usually by a rampy process, resonance enhanced multiphoton ionization. So let's have a look, for example, uh, what's happening here in this time of flight. Uh, Sorry, I should have mentioned that. First, I'm talking about the, uh, we do at this photochemistry using a time of flight. This is not time of flight mass spectrometer. It's a time of flight you will understand in a second why it's not mass spectrometer. But this is in the place where I told you just a second before that we use imaging system. But before we built that imaging system, we were using a time of flight system. And now understand imaging, you will better understand it if I describe the time of flight. And besides, some of the experiments which I'll talk about were done using this time of flight system. So that's why I'm talking about time of flight now. So just don't get confused. I'll talk about imaging in a minute. So let's have a look what happens in this extraction region of this time of flight spectrometer. So imagine a simple molecule like HCl or HI, some hydrogen halide, and imagine that that molecule has a transition moment which excite, where you can excite it into the, this dissociative state so that the transition moment is parallel to the molecular axis. And you have your laser field which has a certain polarization. So you direct your laser so that the polarization is parallel or is actually pointing into the detector. So if you have a polarization of your laser like this, and you have randomly oriented molecules, which have, a tran which have transition moments parallel to their axis, at the moment when the molecule sits like this, you won't dissociate it. You will dissociate it when the molecule is parallel to your laser field. Okay? So you can dissociate it when the molecule points with the hydrogen right into the detector. And the molecule dissociates and the hydrogen, indeed you ionize it and extract it and it arrives into the detector. But you can also dissociate the molecule which is oriented the other way around. Okay? So in this orientation you dissociate the molecule, the fragment starts in the other direction, gets turned around by the electric field and arrives into the detector somewhat later. So if you measure your signal as a function of the time, you will actually get two peaks. First, these fragments are arriving, then these fragments are arriving, and the distance between the two peaks, what it corresponds to. 
it corresponds to the energy which got released in the photodissociation process. So that fragment gets a kick at the beginning, either in this direction or in that direction. So you see the two peaks which are far apart and the distance between them corresponds to the energy which got released. Okay, so uh, now what happens if I put this into the in this molecule into the cluster? So this is the spectrum of the molecule and now I put it into the cluster. And this is how the spectrum changes. So what does that spectrum tell me? Okay, I still, I still see some peaks over here where the original peaks of the molecule were, and those correspond to the fragment which escaped the cluster without interacting somehow, losing any kinetic energy in the interaction. But here, on these shoulders, those are fragments which collided with the cluster and lost part of their kinetic energy. Therefore, they got slower or they got earlier on the other side into the detector. And right in the middle, that's the peak of zero kinetic energy. That's the fragments which got trapped in the cluster, lost their kinetic energy completely, and they got extracted into the, into the detector. So those, that's called cage effect. So this is the kind of information which you can get from such measurements about what's happening during that photodissociation if the fragment escapes the cluster or the aerosol or the nanoparticle or if it gets somehow interacts, loses, uh, loses a certain amount of energy, etc. So this is the information which we are after. Okay, so this is HI in argon. Who the hell is interested in argon? I mean, it's no, no chemistry in there. Okay, but without understanding this, you would not probably understand what's happening if you put HI on water. So this is again time of light spectrum of HI on argon cluster. And you see these direct exit peaks and you see the caging in the middle. And this is HI on water. And you immediately see the differences. You get essentially no free hydrogen coming out of that HI on water. There are no fast fragments. And you see maybe some caging, but is it really caging? The shape of that peak is quite different. And you will see it on the next slide that it's really not caging. It's a completely different process. But before we get to that, uh, I'll tell you one more thing. We wanted to know if this is really the hydrogen from HI. And we did experiment with the I deuterated uh, uh, species. So from the I, indeed, you don't get any hydrogen. So it can't be hydrogen from there. And we know from experiments with pure water clusters, pure ice nanoparticles, you won't get any hydrogens from water. But at the same time, if you use DI on water, you still get this type of signal. So where the signal is coming from? Well, you know, I guess I haven't told that, but you already kind of get, got it. Uh, I'm not a chemist. I'm a physicist. So I can afford to write an equation like this without really blushing red, without being ashamed, because I don't know anything about chemistry. So. Uh, but, and, and you tell me, this is all wrong, this cannot work. But before, before we go there, before we do that, uh, let's assume that something like this can happen, that you can get actually H3O radical from HI and water. And let's have a look on one another thing, okay? Uh, I've told you this is the time of flight peak, and you can convert it into the kinetic energy, because this time of flight here, that corresponds to certain energy of your fragment, okay? So you can work this and this spectrum into the kinetic energy scale, and this is what you get. So here is HI, HBr, HCl on argon is the red spectrum, and the blue spectrum is the same species on water. And this is just the blow up of this region here, okay? So you see how different the spectra are. Here you get the caging and the free exit. And the free exit is indeed different for the different species because chlorine, bromine, or iodine, they are different atoms. 
HBr, HCl, HI have different energetics, and this reflects the energetics. So that's fine, but for these molecules on water, it everything piles up here, and if you look at these spectra in detail, they are essentially the same. So what does that tell you? I'm looking at hydrogen from HI, HBr, HCl, and that hydrogen has the same kinetic energy spectrum. It cannot be coming from different molecule. It has to be coming from the same species. What that species can be? The only thing which we have there, it has to be H3O. Okay, you, st you still don't believe me. I don't blame you, it's fine. I didn't believe it myself. But this idea of H3O is not just, we didn't make it up, okay? We did these experiments in 2007, and actually there is a paper from 2003 and it's a series of paper from Sobolevsky and Domke who theoretically calculate systems where you have this HCl or HI, whatever, with a couple of water molecules. And what they get is, if you have this Twitter ionic structure, meaning Cl minus H3O plus and the waters in between or around, it has excited states which, have, which are within the region, within the reach of our laser energy. And these states are of charge transfer to solvent character, whatever that means. I don't care. Some wave function. And from that excited state, which we can reach with our laser, there is a barrierless transition into the biradical state. Okay? Biradical state means you have Cl radical and H3O radical on that cluster. And we believe that this is what we generate. Well, to believe something, it's one thing, but to prove it is another. But you can actually prove it, and with very nice deuterated experiments. So let's assume we can generate H3O, okay? So in using HI in water, you get H3O. Let's take DI. So in that case, we would be generating H2DO. And if we take HI on heavy water cluster, we would be generating HD2O. Now, in our experiment, I told you at one point that we rampy ionize the hydrogen or the, the species which we look at. And it means it's resonance process. It's only, you are looking only on hydrogen. You are not looking at deuterium. So we look at hydrogen, and if the hydrogen would be coming from these species, provided that we have the same clusters, the same systems, the ratio of the signals from these three systems should be the ratio of these hydrogens, three to two to one. Okay, let's do the experiment. And this is what you get, the, the numbers which you get. For HCl, HBr, HI, always the ratio. And this is the, the this expected value, assuming that it's H3O, and these are the numbers which we measure. This is not a measurement for one afternoon. This is two years of experimenting because you, to do quantitative experiments, to, to compare signals, it's really difficult. So, so these numbers are really nailed down very carefully and you see that within the experimental errors, they agree very nicely with, with the expectation. So, we believe that that hydrogen which we are seeing from this system is coming from something which is, has H3O structure, H3O radical. What is very interesting, maybe for chemists, is, we, you know, as soon as you have deuterium water in ice, you get HD scrambling, okay? Here you have no HD scrambling, essentially, because if there was HB scrambling, imagine having HI on water or HI on heavy water. Here in this system, you have 800 times more hydrogens than in this system. So the signal between this and this system, the ratio of the signals should be 800. And that ratio is three. We can't be two orders of magnitude wrong. So that means that on the time scale of our experiment, there is no HD scrambling. We generate some kind of local ion pair. So that's an interesting point. Uh, okay, so just very briefly, what is happening? We put hydrogen halide on ice particle, and then 
you get acidic dissociation and this Twitter ionic structure gets excited with UV photons and you get something which has an H3O radical. And the hydrogen is coming from that H3O radical. And that's the hydrogen which we are seeing. And this is probably also how it runs in, in the atmosphere. Okay, uh, let me switch the gears. And I have told you that we actually do our photodissociation experiment by imaging, but I was talking just about the time of flight spectrometry. So what that imaging is, okay. What is the drawback of this experiment? I have told you, you have your detector up there and you photolyze the molecule either in this orientation or this orientation. You can photolyze the molecule in this orientation, but the fragment flies over there. You have no detector over there, you have it only there. So you lose, even if you photolyze the molecules, you lose 99% of your signal. So that's, that's a huge waste. As a good experimentalist, you immediately think how, what to do about it. How do we get all these fragments? And there were smart people who actually found out a solution to that. And they use position sensitive detector. So it's MCP, multi-channel multi plate, where you have a phosphor screen on the other side. So what happens is your ion comes into a certain place of your detector. There is an electron avalanche that impinges onto the, uh, onto the phosphor and there is a blink. So you see each individual fragment, where it is coming, to which place in the space it's coming. So if you look at it with your naked eye, you can see where your hydrogens are coming. I love that experiment because you can really see it in the lab. You look through the window into the apparatus and you see your fragments arriving. That's great. Indeed, you don't record it with your eye because especially my memory is very short, so you can't record the whole image. But if you put a CCD camera there, then you can record the image. So what's happening is actually you photolyze this, say, HCL, and if the molecule is randomly oriented, the fragments fly in all directions, and they generate a sphere in space. In space. Now you extract this sphere, they are charged, so you extract it with an electric field over here, and what that sphere is doing, it keeps expanding because there is, it has a velocity, it has an energy in this direction, perpendicular to your field. But in this direction, you kind of squash the, the, the sphere. So from the sphere, you generate a pancake. And that pancake, you just put onto your detector. And what it generates there is a circle, okay? And the radius of that circle, or diameter of that circle, what that corresponds to? Again, to the energy which got released in the photodissociation process. So now if you have processes which have different energetics, you see them as these rings in your image. Now, if you have processes which have a certain anisotropy, like for example, if your molecule is dissociating along the electric field of your laser, along the polarization, that anisotropy you will see in that image as well. So what you are getting is actually spatial 3D information, complete information about the velocity of your fragment. And from that information, again, you can judge something about how the process proceeds. So this type of images you are getting, you are evaluating, and you can say something about the process. For example, again, if we go to this simple example of mechanical processes of direct exit, you see this as, a, as, as rings on your image and the caging, you see a zero energy fragment right in the middle of your image because that's where the fragments with zero kinetic energy are sitting. So you see these beautiful images. Okay, so once you have established this very nice tool, uh, you can look at some uh, real systems, and indeed, since we talk about atmosphere, ozone depletion, our choice, our favorite is uh, CFC, CF2, Cl2. And actually the reason for doing this, we wanted to study this molecule on, on the ice nanoparticles, which indeed is relevant. But we have realized that there is very little known about the dynamics of even photodissociation of this molecule. What the 
atmospheric people need who model the photochemistry or chemistry of atmosphere, what they need is the quantum yield of this system. But uh, they don't care really about the dynamics, how that chlorine is leaving that molecule. But what we find out is actually, okay, this is the kinetic energy spectrum of the chlorine from this reaction and from the photodissociation of this molecule. And what you see here is the fast chlorines from dissociation like this. But we see a bunch of, uh, actually up to 30% of slow chlorines. And the slow chlorines, they can actually come only from processes where two chlorines were relieved for one photon. So actually quantum yield one means one photon comes, you get one chlorine. But we see that actually there are processes on which one photon comes, but two chlorines are released into the atmosphere, which is important. I mean, if you model something where chlorine is actually uh, plugged into the chain reaction of ozone, you want to know, you better know whether you have one chlorine or two chlorines. So uh, that can be important. So could this, could this number be wrong? It doesn't have to. Okay, because if you measure a quantum yield and you have a dark channel, you have a channel where photon comes, gets absorbed, but no chlorine gets released. So that compensates the processes where you get actually two chlorines for, for one photon. So, but this can be only, this cannot be discovered by measuring the quantum yield, but you have to really look at the dynamics of the process and uh, which hasn't been done that much. So this is very recent. This is this year's results and paper. And with that, let me switch the gears and very briefly talk about the uptake of molecules. So far we say, I say, okay, we have these ice particles, we put HCl on them and we do experiments. But how does that HCl attach to the molecule? What's happening in that process? What is actually the cross section of a certain particle for picking up a molecule. That's an important issue in, in, in the atmosphere, as you will see. And we can measure that. We can measure that by measuring the velocity of our beam. How does that go? Uh, well, the assumption is very simple. If you imagine you having having cluster beam, cluster comes into a reservoir filled with gas, pick up cell, and as it picks up even stationary molecules, there is a momentum transfer from the molecule to the, to the cluster, and the cluster is slowed down. So if you measure the velocity, the change in the velocity which the cluster undergoes, as a function of the pressure in that pickup cell, or as a function of the number of collisions in that pickup cell, you can actually evaluate that. From that, you can actually evaluate the pickup cross section. I mean, any of you can derive this formula in 10 minutes. It's really not difficult. And it's very simple assumptions, but it works beautifully. So it's, it's, it's amazing how, how simple things, simple physics can actually work. So you can evaluate the cross section, provided that you know the size of your particles. But we know the sizes of, of ice nanoparticles, of water particles, which we generate. So we can evaluate those cross sections, and this is what we get. Quite interesting thing. So this is the cross section for ice nanoparticles of certain size for different molecules. Water, methane, some noxes, hydrogen halides, and what we call volatile organic compounds. Nothing too complicated, but easy enough to do experiments with. And what is interesting here, indeed it's species dependent. So the cross section for pick up water on water is different than picking up NO2 on water. And the important thing is the cross section can be much larger, more than by factor of two, than the geometrical cross-section. The geometrical size of your particle, which you can evaluate, is here, this blue line. So this cross-section is actually twice as big. So even if the particle comes from 
some distance that it would pass by the cluster. It gets actually attracted and you will see it on this video because indeed once we get these results, once we get these results, we wonder, is it true? So one way to prove it, one way to check it is to do molecular dynamic simulations. Okay, when I say we, I mean my colleague who is now in Switzerland, uh, Juraj Fedor, but uh, he's very skillful in doing theory and this is what he calculates. So he simulates, he shoots the projectile and measures or gets uh, a picture what's happening, how it gets attached. Uh, there are quite a few, okay, let it run once again. Uh, there are quite a few of his video on YouTube. It's very nice, he put some music even to that. <laughs> He's trying to beat this, this guy with rap or whatever, but nobody's clicking on that. Anyway, uh, then you have indeed, you do some statistics, you do many simulations, uh, you evaluate that, and what you get in the end effect are these blue points, so those are the model cross sections for the different species, and it actually agrees nicely with the experiment. So, uh, to make the long story short, just the take home message is that the cross section, for example, for water molecule on ice nanoparticle can be significantly larger than the geometrical cross section of the water cluster. And this in the models of uh, nucleation, in all these nucleation theories, where you start, you start with small water clusters and you add water molecules. And for that you need some cross section. You need to know some, and that number can be by factor of three uh, actually larger than if you put there just the geometrical cross section. So somebody has to pick up on that and maybe incorporate it in some theories. Anyway, switch the gears once again and uh, that the last experiment I'll talk about, mixed uh, nitric acid particles. Uh, indeed, when I talk about polystrospheric clouds, there are some pure water ices but maybe more important are the ternary mixtures of nitric acid, sulfuric acid, water. Indeed, putting all these species in such an expensive apparatus uh, uh, and killing the whole apparatus is not easy, so we start slowly, so we started with water and nitric acid, and first we have to learn how to generate these species. We generate the mixed clusters and we have to characterize them somehow. So we have just used simple mass spectrometry. When I say simple, we have this time, uh, reflectron time of flight, which is actually quite fancy. Uh, it has a resolution of uh, 10,000 and we can go to quite large molecules. So resolution of 10,000 means that if you have a cluster which has the mass of 10,000 mass units, you still resolve whether you get one hydrogen more or less in the cluster. So, which can be quite important in the case of these clusters. Anyway, you just simply electron ionize the clusters and you get some mass spectrum. This is some kind of analysis of that spectrum. So what you have here, you have these series. This is just the black points are, say, protonated water clusters, K equals one, two, three, etc. Here you start with having protonated water clusters with one HNO3 molecule, two HNO3 molecules, three HNO3 molecules, four, five, etc. So the interesting thing here is that each size has a certain threshold or minimum. So it starts to grow somewhere. So what, what does that tell you? It tells you, okay, as I add water, more and more water molecules to HNO3, at some point, something happens in the system which not suddenly the clusters will grow more. You will have more intensity. So what that something can be? I mean, you have HNO3 and water. What can happen as you are adding more and more waters to the, to the HNO3? It's the same case like HCl. You add more and more waters to HCl and at some point acidic dissociation happens. So these thresholds are actually points to acidic dissociation of which, which is happening in the system. So that's one interesting information from there, but it's not that new actually. Uh, we wanted to be sure because we are looking at the mass spectrum, we are looking at the ionized species, but 
what happens, what is the neutral species, what are the precursors? And to learn something about that, you cannot look at the neutral clusters, you cannot look at the neutral species. You have to ionize to do mass spectrometry. But there is a method where you can have a fragmentation-free ionization, and it's sodium doping. This method has been actually even advocated by some groups as general method for sizing of atmospheric aerosols. So that's something which might be speaking to you. It's actually not that general, as you will see. But the idea, essentially the idea is you put sodium into the cluster. What happens is the sodium has this electron loosely attached. And this electron can be rebound and generate solvated electron in the cluster. And that solvated electron has a binding energy of about only 3 eV. So with a laser, which has relatively low energy, normally for ionization you need 10 eV of energy, or even more. Here you can just go in with photon of 3 eV, which is not that difficult to get with lasers, and it detaches the electron. And since the energy is so low, it's very soft method. And so the mass spectrum, which you then measure, reflects the neutral cluster sizes, neutral cluster size distribution. So this is what we do. Take our HNO3 clusters from, uh, mix, uh, from concentrated nitric acid vapor. We do sodium attachment and we measure the mass spectrum. This is what we get. We get nothing. Does the method not work? Well, the method works very nicely. This is pure water and it works well. So why we don't see anything here? Well, we start to, di to dilute our nitric acid. We put more and more water. And when we dilute more than 100 times, we start seeing peaks, but those are just water, protonated water peaks. There, here is a different scale. So these peaks are these here. So what's happening is if you have enough water that you get essentially just water expansion, you start seeing water. But as soon as you have HNO3 there, you won't see any clusters. Why is that? Okay, probably as you as chemists would give me that answer a long time ago, but it took us some time to realize that actually sodium indeed reacts with HNO3 by charge transfer. And once you get this reaction, you can have no solvated electron, so your detachment, uh, photodetachment doesn't work. So you can't see these clusters. The method, the sodium doping method, is blind to the clusters where something like this happens. So that's one take-home message. But actually the other, maybe more important take-home message for atmosphere is that all those clusters which we see, we know that we have these clusters because we see them by electron ionization. Only by sodium doping we don't see them. But what that means, that means that all those clusters even those which, where we see only water fragments, all of them contain HNO3 molecule, which in turn means HNO3 is a very effective nucleation center, and it can act as such also in the atmosphere. Okay, uh, I guess I run out of my time, so uh, I'll skip the photostability, uh, for, uh, the, the bio, uh, bio stuff. And I'll just go to the, to the very end and uh, show you how the apparatus, actually you won't see the apparatus in our lab as such because it has been also extended, but most importantly, this is at the, the, to the photo is taken at the moment when we were still building it. And now it's kind of sandwiched with a lot of lasers around, so it's a very crowded place. But this is the uh, great apparatus from, from Gettingen. But this is just essentially a piece of uh, stainless steel. What really counts, what's really important, is what's behind. And there are people behind. And especially, and usually, as usually, the most important people are really in the very background. So let me acknowledge my colleagues, especially Vicky Poteria, who is the uh, postdoc who started with me in 2005. And she is the real heart of, the, of that difficult apparatus. Andrei Pisanenko is keeping that apparatus nicely running and everything. Uh, Uri Fedorev, unfortunately, is not on the picture because he uh, was a postdoc who left uh, for uh, Switzerland now. Uh, Yaroslav is 
a very bright uh, PhD student who is actually following his tracks. So he is currently also in Switzerland. And uh, Josef is a very bright. He's actually the only chemist suffering in our group of, of physicists. But he doesn't look much like suffering on this picture. But he does actually suffer when I talk about chemistry. But he's nice. He always corrects me. So it's fine. Uh, Pavla Serchkova, another PhD student. Uh, and then uh, students who actually already left the group. Uh, we have a great collaboration with Petr who is a great theoretician, you probably know him, he talked at the seminar, and his, uh, mm, his magic is that he can essentially calculate anything what we measure. So that's always great to have someone like that. Uh, and I'm very grateful to Udo Buch from whose laboratory in getting and actually this apparatus came uh, with me to Prague. And uh, I thank you for your attention.